uh, I think we're going to get started. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Nick Tavanera and I'm one of our GEA representatives. Uh, along with Maria and Hannah and Andrew right there, we'd like to welcome and thank Farouko for joining us uh, this evening. And um, I'd like to thank Gabe Zagorski for doing video again for us. It's very generous. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Uh, this is a great event that we do each year and hopefully we continue to do so uh, for many years to come. And I'm looking forward to this year's edition. Um, about all I have to say, I'm going to turn it over to our department chair, Carl Goodman, to say a few words about Bob and tell you all a bit more about the event. Enjoy it. Have a good evening. <laughs> Okay, so it's, uh, it's my honor to uh, welcome you to the, uh, the Lucky 13th uh, Annual uh, Rosenthal uh, Memorial Lecture. Uh, I want to add a few, uh, a few thanks to the ones that Nick mentioned. Uh, uh, first, I want to thank the Rosenthal family who have uh, generously uh, donated to make this uh, possible. Uh, we are working on uh, setting up a fund that would uh, endow this, uh, this year permanently. And, encourage you to go to the website at some point if you need a tax deduction and uh, one of which is Rosenthal, or put in Rosenthal Endowment Fund and uh, make a contribution. Uh, I also want to, uh, uh, and I should also thank, there's a, a number of other people besides the Rosenthal family who are donating to that fund, you know, family, friends, colleagues, and lives. Uh, so join that list. Uh, second, I want to thank the GEA. Uh, uh, well, I don't need to point them out again. This thing's just pointed them out. But, uh, but uh, they've done a lot of work in, in organizing this. Uh, also, uh, I have to uh, thank Norma. She, 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 I can't believe Norma left. Okay, so Norma, uh, Norma Hardeo, who, uh, as uh, anybody in this room who's uh, been to this thing and knows, is uh, the person that uh, keeps us all in line and makes this go every year. Uh, and uh, the last person I want to thank is uh, is Guru for, for coming. I don't get to introduce him. That's uh, what Jawad is going to do. Uh, but I have to say that I'm very happy that he was uh, chosen as a speaker uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is that I knew he would wear a black T-shirt so I could get away without a tie, <laughs> which I really. But it's his formal black T-shirt. So, uh, uh, so I started. <laughs> uh, Secondly, and more seriously, I, you know, I have to say, Farouk uh, is, is, is one of my very favorite economists because, as you'll, you'll soon uh, learn if you don't already know, uh, he thinks very deeply about very interesting things. And I think you'll hear him inside the whole interesting thing. Uh, of course, as you know, this event is to uh, commemorate the, the memory of Bob Rosenthal. Uh, I was not fortunate enough to, to be uh, a colleague of Bob's. Uh, I know he, I guess dubious distinction of being, I, to the best of my knowledge, the last person he hired. Uh, so uh, it, was, it was Bob and, and Christoph who uh, convinced me to come out for a job talk when I was uh, actually quite happy uh, at University of Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, uh, it was the prospect of being colleagues with uh, uh, some of the people here now and, and of course quite prominently Bob uh, that convinced me to, uh, to accept the offer. And, and uh, just six weeks later, uh, uh, Bob passed away, so I never got to, uh, to experience that. Uh, I have to say, when Bob passed away, I, I, you know, I thought, you know, do I really want to go? <laughs> I, was, I was happy with my and, uh, and, it, and it struck me that, uh, that Bob would be pissed if I, <laughs> if I turned around and, and, uh, and did that. So, so I came, and, and obviously very glad that I did. Uh, one of my clearest memories of Bob uh, was from uh, 1998. Uh, we were at uh, Jerusalem at the same time, uh, visiting Hebrew University. And I, I had just moved to Wisconsin at that point. Uh, and that was like my third move in the previous five years, so uh, people were teasing me about that a lot. Uh, and, and we sort of had this sort of joking thing of, okay, who was the economist with the largest number of quote unquote permanent uh, jobs. Uh, and uh, somebody said, uh, Bob was in the other room when we were having this discussion. Somebody said, Bob, we should go ask Bob, because Bob would be correct. And so we went and asked Bob, and he was, he was so irritated uh, that we would ask this question. And in part, he was irritated because it was pretty juvenile. Uh, uh, 
but Bernie was irritated because he, at that point, he, as he made clear to us in his response, he thought it would be you as his home. And, and the thought that he was sort of a, a traveler who might move on I, I kind of offended him. Uh, this place was very special to Bob, and, and Bob was a very special part of this place. Uh, and I think it's, it's a perfect uh, memorial for Bob to, to have this event because it's exactly the kind of thing he would have enjoyed. He, uh, he was very dedicated to the graduate students in this department, and I think he likes the idea that what we do is invite somebody to come in and talk with the graduate students. And of course, he would have enjoyed this on So, uh, with that, we turn it over to Joa to introduce things. Bart. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce today's uh, speaker. So let me begin with some background. Uh, Farouk did his uh, bachelor's at Bonavici University and his PhD in economics from Princeton. Uh, his first appointment was at Stanford Business School from where uh, he went on to join the economics department at Northwestern. And from there he went back to Princeton to join the economics department there. He's a fellow of the Econometric Society. He's currently a co-editor uh, at Theoretical Economics and has served on the editorial board, uh, boards at uh, Econometrica, Jet, Games, AR, Micro, and Nintendo. He has published extensively in prestigious journals such as uh, Econometrica, uh, Journal of Political Economy, ADR, we uh, By my count, he has 12 publications in Econometrica, but he has not been able to see me, so I don't know. <laughs> um, he is an economic theorist. Uh, he's done influential work in decision theory, bargaining, theoretical political economy, and many other topics like the meaning of strategic rationality and being. On a personal note, I'm a huge fan uh, of his work, his decision theory work on uh, temptation and self control with uh, Wolfgang Kessendorfer. It totally rocked my world when I, when I read it as a grad student. Um, and it was really a major source of inspiration for me in grad school and beyond that. Uh, you can imagine my excitement when uh, he came to Rochester while he was actually here to come give a talk and, you know, uh, I got to meet him and um, I, I remember very clearly after the meeting, I, I, left, I left that room with a huge smile on my face, totally starstruck, thinking to myself, wow, he asked such difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, he, he's been very generous with his advice uh, early on in the career and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I continue to this day to derive a lot of inspiration from his work. So thank you and uh, ladies and gentlemen, far away. Uh, um, sort of attitude towards risk. Uh, 
so for example, consider, would you be willing to put down $100 on, uh, on the uh, Republican candidate winning the next election? And if he does, if he does, he get $180 back. Now, you may agree with the point four, but disagree with this person who's putting this in this respect. So this, this attitude towards the uncertainty, I want to say, with this probability of us to be subjective or uh, communal is different than risk attitude or uncertainty. So, for example, uh, two people may have the same assessment. One would be willing to bet the big to bet because he's more less risk of risk or one would need to. Or one could not even be expected to be maximizing that a different option. But all of this, what I'm trying to say, uh, I guess, is that uh, there is a way of summarizing these people's assessment of the uncertainty of this group, or is going to share this view, with these real numbers. And what, I, what we'd like to do, what this paper is trying to do, uh, is to replicate that in the situation where people's assessment of the uncertainty why is this interesting? Why do we want to do that? Well, if you look at typical economic models, uh, probabilities are somehow, all this is subjective in some sense, but probabilities are less so. Um, there's a way of relating probabilities to frequencies. In economic models, we assume that there's a common shared uncertainty about them. Either, either everybody has the same assessments or everybody has the same assessments of modulo uh, probability information. But there aren't many, I think, uh, you know, these things are always with this, but let me just say that we're understanding the <coughs> sharing of the shortcomings. There isn't really a way of summarizing gambling assessment, aside from the involved attitudes towards gambling. So we can model the patch kind of way. And that's what we want to do. Uh, we want the assessment of uncertainty to be compatible with different attitudes towards <coughs> and different theories of those in the um, okay. So, in the end, all this talk, what is he, what is he going to give us? Well, I'm going to offer something kind of familiar that we've done many, many years ago. Uh, so it's going to, the, my, our version of probability is going to assign an interval of the elements, that the size of that interval somehow making the effect of the amount of uncertainty. And I will hopefully get the chance to do it uh, all of these ideas are out there, so they're not, you know, not inventing something. We're not offering something new. We're offering a different, maybe, combination of things in a different way. Yeah. Uh, okay. So each event is going to be associated uh, with an interval. Uh, that should be, the second one should be 1 minus pi of AC, not pi of AC, but sorry about that. Um, so that's the maximal or the minimal event, the probability of this event, and the maximal or minimal probability of this complement at 1 minus. This is uh, exactly the same object so far as what's offered in density trade in the 60s and 70s. Our contribution, if you want to call it that, is our version is going to be somewhat more restrictive than theirs. And we're going to derive it from somehow from preferences and a generous definition of okay. Uh, okay, so this is this is the picture for this uh, uh, for this thought experiment, for this whole paper. Uh, so uh, if you're not familiar with it, we'll just give it a little introduction. So this is supposed to be a generic version of what's known as the Ellsworth paradox. So you should somehow think of each one of these rectangles, the nine here, small ones, as interchangeable, at least for now, uh, in terms of, you know, they're as likely as each other. Uh, but you should think of columns as being somehow unambiguous things. Those are things like the, the counterparts in the standard. Those are things that you can assign probability to one of those. The rows are um, un ambiguous. So they're, they're interchangeable, these row, but there's some uh, ambiguity there. So what's our, how do you uh, make another person and, and, and 
ambiguity, ambiguous, or feel ambiguity, you load the dice in an experiment like Ellsberg did, and you say, look, I'm going to put uh, three balls in an earth, very simple version of the Ellsberg paradox. And one of them, exactly one ball has the number one written on it, exactly one ball has the number two written on it, and one ball has the number three. The balls also have various colors, but I'm not going to tell you what. So this is supposed to, supposed to evoke in you a sense that betting on the color of a ball is an ambiguous thing, that betting on the number of the thing is About the colors, all I'm going to tell you is that there's one red, one green, and one blue. So we're going to change the story a little bit along the way, but really that's the thing. That's the yeah. And everything we do is the modular technicalities and all of them continues to continue stuff. So what, what does ambiguity mean other than the fact that it's associated with the story, this elsewhere thing? Well, one uh, obvious impact, uh, effect of ambiguity is that you may feel uh, that B, if you feel B is more likely than A, then a probability theory, a typical view of probability says that B union C must be more likely than A union C. And that's the additivity. Of probability, and that's what gives it all the cardinal things and everything. That's what, that's the whole. That's what makes everything all together. Okay, and everything else is a normalization. Okay, and, and, and the converse is also true. If you think B union C is more likely than A union C, then you have to be B is more. Likely. Okay. Now, again, this is. These are bets, so if you were willing to bet on B, if you were more likely to bet on B, by that I mean, suppose a situation like this. We're going to draw a state, draw a ball, and if B occurs, then B occurs, you're going to get $100. If it doesn't occur, you're going to lose $75. Like and now the question is, would you rather bet on B with $100 and losing $75, or would you rather bet on A? This kind of thought. Okay. So where does the, this, how does the story of not knowing the color relate to the non-attitude? So that's, that's my uh, story here. Well, here's how it goes. Look at A and B. So you're betting on, A means you're betting on red. You're betting on, you, get, you, you win if the ball number one is drawn and it happens to be red. B means you win if, you, uh, if the ball number two is drawn and it happens. In all other cases, if you've taken the A, you lose. In all other cases, if you've taken the B, you lose. Okay? And suppose we're in a situation where you feel you're, you'd rather bet on B than A. But, I want to claim, it could be that if you buy the story, the Ellsworth text story, you might want to switch and bet, bet on A union C on rather than B union C. Why would you do such a reversal? Well, A and B, you know, they're very symmetric. Maybe we're different between the two. But if I add C, notice that adding C to the two uh, remaining integers completes a column for A. And that's really what we're going to be talking about for the next hour. So but that completing a, a, a column makes all the difference in the world. Now, A union C, uh, a union C is an unambiguous one-third probability event. B union C is 3 out of 9, 2, but it's not lined up. And that's what keeps them in the from. You're facing color risk as a whole. Well. Right? Um, so in particular, there's verbiage associated. By the way, this is a version of the answer. This is exactly what happens. The numbers are different and stuff. Colors may be chosen to taste, but it's the same thing. Uh, somebody who loves ambiguity, and in fact people do, by the way, explain to do that. When you're betting on more odds kinds of things, people seem to like ambiguity. You know, the more fuzz, maybe something will help them out. Uh, people don't like ambiguity, maybe that's become substantial and people close to even better. Um, so uh, somebody who loves ambiguity um, might prefer B union C to A union C. Uh, but somebody who doesn't like it might prefer B union C to B union C, even if they were indifferent. So now I want to give you a little this, but we don't have to point I want to tell you this sort of the model that's being emerged from this. 
And this is the sort of simplest example. Uh, we're going to find, instead of the probability, a single uh, function that we're assigning a number to each box and millions of boxes, we're going to have two numbers. Okay? One number is going to be assigned to each box. Another number is going to be assigned to each column. And the way we're going to do this is to look at this example. So the number that's assigned to each box is going to be delta over 9, where delta is some number between 0 and 1. So if you add up 9 times delta over 9, that's uh, delta. So that's going to add up to less than 1. But each time you fill out a column, you're going to get, get the whole one third. So something like A is going to get at least the one third plus delta over one. Uh, something like B is going to get uh, one third plus two delta. So the difference between what A gets and one minus what B gets is going to be that range. Right? That's going to be the range. Uh, and that's the model. So we're going to derive that from some assumptions about how you your bag, very okay. Yeah. okay. So I just want to very briefly tell you that of this type of exercise, the best known is Savage's version of it. Uh, Savage's version has a technical uh, uh, feature that it's only finitely additive if you take the disjoint probabilities of disjoint collection of events uncountable for the infinite of the defense, it may not be uh, adequate. We're going to do a version of that that's savage. Again, this is just for this kind of example, there's nothing new here. We're going to be combining savages here uh, with uh, another later version, just to illustrate and compare a you know, if, if everything were perfect, if we could do all we wanted to, we would have this here. But we're not going to be able to do this in certain ways. This is supposed to encourage you to have sympathy for our community. Right. So the science theory has three uh, assumptions. One of them is the, is the one that gets the additivity. It says if you like A better than B, you must like A better than C, provided C does what you say. The second assumption, the next two assumptions are two technical assumptions. Okay. That Squiggly shape is a binary relation that means it's a complete, in this point, means a complete and transitive ranking of all these bets. Remember, a bet I'm using to be synonymous with an event because that event tells you when you get the money, and if that event doesn't occur, you lose something. So you want that event to occur. So you rank which would you rather, you know, which event would you rather bet? Would you rather bet on uh, a Republican president or a uh, from Spain and the US economy. At the same price, same win, same loss. Okay? Uh, the second condition says that you can divide events very fine. So that's Savage's version of that. Uh, so that means that if you like A better than B, I can slice up the entire event space into such small slivers that adding any sliver to B is not going to overturn that. And the third one is a continuity axiom. That's the part that gives you the um, uh, countable, uh, countable additivity. That's the part that Savage didn't use. That's from subsequent work in the 60s. Okay. And Savage's theorem says if you have a binary relation where it satisfies the obvious things, it's complete transitive, and getting money for sure is better than losing money for sure, and bigger events are better. Then, then what? Well, I'll show you that. Just a brief uh, refresher. A means, A means, the additivity axiom, it means no ambiguity, as I've been talking about. F and C are technical requirements. F is B really savages big innovation. If you look at sort of the way people were talking about P savage, and afterwards, this is, this is what puts the stuff together. And C is the comfortable additivity requirement. And here's savages theorem. A probability measure in a sigma algebra we're going to call non-atomic. If any time an event has a positive probability, then you can find a subset habit that has a probability less than that event that's greater than zero. 
Okay, and Savage is scared of this version of it and say that there's a non atomic probability mu such that A is preferred to B, if and only if mu A is greater than mu B, if and only if the binary relationship is a continuous qualitative probability that satisfies all the things on this act. Okay, so this is our uh, this is our benchmark. So the closer we get in a way manner that allows us to interject the word ambiguity when we need it, the better we get. Back to the Ellsberg experiment. Uh, again, look at the event A, that's really a bet on red. Right? You're only winning if the red ball is chosen, but you don't care if the moon ball is all. And the event E, uh, that's a bet on one, and that's an unambiguous thing. So that is like EF, maybe an ambiguous event, ABC, and then the general, typically. Um, a is more ambiguous than E. So in our world, the, the range of, you know, uh, the lower end and the upper end of the probability assigned to E is the same. It's going to be one third. The other one has a range. Okay? And like I said, an ambiguity loving person may refer to that on E, the other one refers to Okay. Here are two events. I'm going to use a word just like it was an everyday word, and in the next slide, make that a Warming you up, hopefully. Uh, so events one and e, and e and F are both unambiguous and then similar. They're in, they're in the sort of they're in the comparable class. Um, so what I want to say is, if they're similar, you should be able to bet on them without. I should be able to decide what you prefer to bet on without knowing the ambiguity. It's either more likely or not. I want to think A and B are ambiguous, but in this sense, uh, they're also similar. And once it, they're comparably ambiguous. There's, you know, they have the same, in the sense that they're really as ambiguous as things get. In what sense I mean, no ambigu unambiguous event fits inside A or fits inside the complement of A. Same with B. Basically, it's chopping up every unambiguous event. And that's making it very inevitable. Okay? All right. I want to claim A and B are similar too. Of course, A is, a, in a real sense, A looks better. I mean, there are lots of squares, rectangles filled in with A. It's clear that you can, but I, that's not my point in this line. I want to say they're similar because they're equally ambiguous. In what sense? Again, they're, they're ruining, they're destroying the same unambiguous uh, events. One, two, and anything that can be Okay? The thing that's being added is a nice chunk of uh, uh, unambiguous events. So again, what am I saying? What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, we might have reason to hope that we will consider comparing such events <coughs> and by easy means without reflecting on their ambiguity attitude. Okay. Again, these are not simple. You see B messed up only the first column, but A messed up two columns. Okay. So maybe this is hard. And maybe attitude is going to matter here. <coughs> Uh, then you may want to go with A. If you like things to be less ambiguous, you may want to go B. Okay. So how are we going to represent this? What we're going to say, A is more likely, that is, in terms of this common perception of these people, this group who agree on the uncertainty here, if the probability of A is bigger than B, and the probability of B complement is bigger than A. So that means the bottom end of that interval for A has to be an higher, and the top end of that interval. But this ranking is incomplete, right? So in particular, if the bottom end of A is better, but the bottom end of B is better, then an ambiguity averse person uh, may like A better, but an ambiguity loving person may like B better. 
In that case, this number by itself, uh, this interval by itself, isn't going to be um, determined whether you take a particular vector or not. But it is going to summarize the common perception of the answer. Okay? So I'll So that's the first part. So that, you know, it's some axiom stuff are going to show up. I have to um, uh, explain to you what that means and hope you to get you to lean in that in my direction. The second part is, is the counterpart of uh, Savage's technical contribution. Not only is there going to be an interval, you're going to be able to, you should be able to calibrate that through just the unambiguous events. So, if you're thinking about an ambiguous events, this pi is going to be additive. So it's going to assign to the, what it assigns to the E and E complement is going to add up. That's because they are unambiguous, they're in triple collapses. Uh, and therefore it gives a complete ranking over an ambiguous events. And then, therefore, one side is enough. Now, here's what I want to set up as an interpretation. I want to say, look, take a generic event A and suppose its probability is bigger than the probability uh, of, e, of E. Well, that means that even the most ambiguity averse person should prefer A. Because the lower probability of E, he's speaking to prefer A, the lower probability of A is at least A. But the upper probability of A is going to be bigger than that of E because ambiguity stretches that. Okay, so this means even the most ambiguity averse person should prefer that on A to E. This means even the most ambiguity loving person should prefer that on E to A. And now, find an event E such that the first equality holds and an event F such that the second equality holds. That means that these two events bracket your A, right? So uh, uh, these are the events which have probabilities between E and F are those events that have the feature that the ranking might be ambiguous. Right? So that's the calibration, and that's what gives the papers. So we're saying we can judge uh, your answer, quantify your perception or your attitude, your, your, your perception of ambiguity by asking you what is the least likely event that would have the property that even the most ambiguity of any person would rather bet on this least, uh, this uh, unambiguous event, and what is the most likely unambiguous event that would have the uh, property that even the most ambiguity of any person would prefer to bet on A. And in that way, we're going to be able to calculate. So that's going to be the third experiment. OK, so formally, what is that going to entail? Um, uh, so we're going to define something called an uncertainty measure that has these two things in the delta of the uh, nines and the uh, one thirds. Uh, we're going to define what it means uh, to have a binary relationship that has ambiguity that reflects your uh, perception of ambiguity. We're going to provide a savage type foundation to that axioms to get uh, from this preference relation to this numerical representation. And then finally, maybe hopefully time permitting, we're going to see how this can create a general theory of choice for what we sort of how you could extend this to a general period uh, of Okay. A um, few terms, uh, hopefully all familiar. If not, it really doesn't matter that much. Let me go through them very briefly. So there are going to be a couple of uh, sigma algebras. Um, um, something is additive, it can be just additive. It's the first thing that says A union B, Q of A union B is equal to Q of A plus Q of B minus Q of A intersection. A probability that's additive. It's going to be continuous if, if you look at a, a nested set of events such that their entire intersection is the empty set, then the limit of those probabilities of those events should go to zero. So that's the thing that gives you countable additivity from the first one. Then we're going to call a set function capacity if the sigma algebra turns out to be sigma, which is the set, largest set of the 
consider, and omega gets 1. We're going to go over the probability if it's, uh, omega gets 1 and it's additive. We're going to call it a measure if it's added countably additive. Okay? We're going to go the probability measure if it's countably additive in this one. Given a probability measure, um, mu, and it, with its own sigma algebra E, uh, square bracket A is the set of all events that you can fit in there, all unambiguous events that you can fit in. Okay? We're going to call a set whole if anything, any subset of it is also in the, the, the sigma algebra. Okay? Um, we're going to call a set uh, null if it has probability zero, and the probability measure complete if every null set is whole. Again, this whole concept is something we made up, but using that, the definition of complete is Okay. <clears throat> okay, here's the key definition. So this is the object that we're going to derive from our representation. We're going to say the probability measure mu e and the measure eta sigma are compatible, so this is the counterpart of the one-third, one-third, one-third of delta over nine, if mu, uh, mu assigns a higher value to anything in the domain of mu than eta. Notice that eta is defined on every set, <coughs> mu is defined on a subcollection of those set. So to be compatible, eta has to give you a probability less than that of mu, for every uh, argument in the domain of mu, that happens to be non null. So whenever mu doesn't give zeros to something, eta has to give it something less. And then when, then whenever uh, whenever e is whole, so that e is a set that says that every subset of it is included in this uh, domain of mu, then the eta of that. Okay? So that's what it is. And here's the object that we're going to get. We're going to call a pi an uncertainty measure if you can write it in this way. So the probability, if you want to call it that, of a set A, is the largest unambiguous set that you can fit into it. Assign that the probability of mu. And to the rest, give it this lower order. So this is exactly what I was doing. Either. Find the, pick as many columns as you can uh, into A, then compute their mu value, their unambiguous, uh, their probability. And on the remainder, apply the A. Okay? Now, because of the compatibility condition, this particular definition star turns out to be equivalent to this particular. So instead of maximizing the argument, maximizing the value of the first part and minimizing the second, you can maximize the sum. Because after all, mu gives higher <coughs> values. So the way to maximize the whole thing is to put as much on the mu side as possible. And do that. Okay. So again, this is that picture. Uh, the magenta color tells you that each column is uh, one third. So if I look at the magenta, I'm going to pick the E is going to be 1, because that's the largest hand in the set I can fit in there. So the pi of that is going to be 1 third, because each column has 1 third. And then there is a little magenta in column 2 left, and, and that's delta over uh, 9. So it's going to be 1 third plus delta. Okay. So here's the proposition. These are just, you know, these results are the results when you say, you know, there's a utility function that represents it, and then at the end you say, and it's unique up to a long term transformation. So these are that kind of the technical background observations. What this observation is saying that if you have an uncertainty measure, so if you have one of my guys here, the pies, one of these pies, then there is only one way to separate it into a mu and an eta. And it's a unique mistake. And in fact, you can find the E, the domain of the mu, simply by identifying those uh, elements where the mu value sum, uh, where the pi value, oh, pi, those should be pi, I'm very sorry, where the pi value sum up. Okay? So 
I give you a pi, how are you going to write it in these two? How are you going to identify these two functions? Well, had I not made a typo here, <laughs> the answer would be that look at all the cases where the pi of a plus the pi of a complement add up one, that's going to be exactly the same. Okay, that's the first thing. The second result is that pi is going to be a convex function. What that means is if you have two sets and you compute the pi of A union B and add to that pi of A intersection B, uh, that's going to be giving you a higher value than pi of A plus pi. What that means is we, this is increasing the mass. So there's, there's, you know, there's a, uh, and every one of these guys is going to be uh, complex. It's going to be a little more than that. It's going to be a belief function. Well, what's a belief function? Remember I said in these people, Dempster, Schaefer, they said they, uh, they have something like this, but this is the sense in which they're objects for belief function. They are only about belief function. So this proposition establishes that we're being more restricted. We are belief functions, but there are other belief functions. Okay. That's it. Okay, that's all the background stuff. So now let me tell you, hopefully my computer comes. Okay? So, few definitions. Uh, a set A is null. If, so, what are, the, what are we doing now? We're trying to say, look, here's how we understand probability. Here's how Savage thought of probability. He said, look, you have a ranking of events, and there's a really unique way of representing this ranking uh, with a, uh, if the ranking satisfies some nice properties, AFC, whatever form, if it satisfies some nice properties, then there is a unique way of representing that to the probability. And if uh, you have a probability, then it will satisfy these properties. We want to do an analogous that to one of our pies, one of our uh, uncertainties. We're going to say, we're going to impose restrictions on your binary relation. This is not incomplete binary relation that leaves room for your assessment of uh, your, uh, your attitude towards ambiguity to influence how you choose even among bets, even among binary things. You want A to come, B to come. So here's the thought experiment. Think of yourself, somehow you agree that you have the same perception of the underlying uh, <coughs> But some of you are more risk averse, Others are more ambiguity. And now I want to say, how could I ask you various questions to identify the uncertainty per uh, uh, perception part of it? And if, suppose I got a representative sample. Every, every attitude was represented here. I ask people, would you rather let A or B? And hands raised. And if everybody raises in favor of A, I say, oh, these people, uh, A is really good for B. Some people raise A and other people raise B. I said, hmm, this is not. Obviously, something else than the common perception that I postulated is determining how that is. Okay? As far as the purest revealed uh, preference experiments go, this is a stone throw away. Uh, uh, it's verifiable. I mean, I can hypothesize that two people all have the same idea. Then check, ask these questions. Then conclude that the axioms that are about to come are satisfied. Then pat myself in the trophy and go home. <laughs> or you could violate my axioms and I could say, oops, they were not satisfied. But it is a somewhat more baroque uh, experiment than the typical one when you take one person and you say, well, what do you But the whole thing, the whole point of this talk is that you can't do that when there's only a ball. Because even on little bets, like betting on it or space, the ambiguity attitude will play a role. Okay, here's the definition of non-degenerate means omega is non If you're indifferent between getting a hundred dollars no matter what happens and getting zero dollars, then I can't help. This is not the theory for you. Okay. Uh, uh, e is an unambiguous if, notice that this is a form of additivity. What it says is, any time you take an A and B that doesn't intersect B, E doesn't upset um, uh, the ranking. If you think of the, the interval value thing, what he, what he does is push the intervals equal by equal amounts to the right. 
So it increases both the lower end and the upper end by the same amount for both. Okay? And, and that's what's going to happen. So that's going to be our definition of unambiguous. Okay? Calibrated. What's going to be our definition? Well, I want to think it's exactly what I said. I'm going to say, uh, look at all the unambiguous events that are less likely than A, and look at all the unambiguous events that are less likely than B. Remember I was going to say I can calibrate the point. Well, if there are more unambiguous events that, that, are, that are less good than A, then there are unambiguous events that are less good than B, then I'm saying, okay, on one side, A is done better. If it also does better on the other side, so that, what does that mean? That there are uh, fewer unambiguous events that have the feature that even the most ambiguity people have a person wouldn't prefer A to them than B, and that's a, that's a good sign for A again. So if both are satisfied, then A has to be. And conversely, if A is preferred to be, both has to be. You can see the incompleteness of the thing, because I have two criteria. Unlike on the world of sports, where they say, what do you do you have to do? And to win, and the announcer will say, yeah, you have to do this and that. And you never understand what happened. And the other thing has to be two other things. You never understand what happens. Nobody cleans up. So this will generate an incompleteness. We are aware. Okay? And we're going to say A is strictly preferred to B when both of these things Again, we need to do something for strict preference because normally in uh, strict preference we assume you know, the absence of one preference. But we can't do that here because of the A lot of the technical uh, difficulties to get something going with incompleteness. Okay? If you think of how you do proofs in various uh, courses and places and papers, you see that completeness played a lot of role. It was a good thing. Okay, we're going to say A is monotone if you like bigger sets and better. And so if a, B is contained in A, B is weakly better. Moreover, if the added part of B is non null, then B has to be strict. Again, these definitions would be just right, so they should match with your intuition in the completeness case. Here, the null. Okay. So the first axiom of this, this binary relationship is monotone, non-degenerate, and calibrated. Okay? Monotonicity immediately implies reflexivity because anything that's contained in less good than A has to be less good than A. Right? So uh, uh, calibration implies transitivity because seven is used. Okay? Um, but nothing implies, nothing here implies this and that's a good thing. Okay. Now, remember I can't have additivity, but I can't say, well, no additivity, let's, let's give up. I need something, I need things to work over unambiguous events, for example. So, uh, and uh, at the heart of this is this notion that the way to explain the Ellsberg paradox is to think of which unambiguous events are getting destroyed. So we want to weaken additivity to a situation in which it's maintained only when, to the extent that the new set C that's being added destroys the same new sets, or completes the same new sets for both A and B. That's a mouthful, and I didn't get it all right, but hopefully I'll do better in the OK. So the notion of similar is, and again, once again, it means that every, um, what is it? these are the things that A, unambiguous sets, that the, whatever, the angular uh, brackets list the set of all unambiguous sets that A doesn't break up, okay? So for example, A breaks up one. It also breaks up one union two, one union three, etc. but one maybe it's destroying one union two because it's destroying one. B breaks up one and doesn't harm anything else. So these are similar. Okay? The second axiom says, if two sets are similar, then you have completeness. Okay? So 
you have no trouble. They're equally ambiguous, so the intervals must be shifting the same way. Okay. The second one says uh, that unambiguous sets are similar. Remember, we had a choice related definition of ambiguity. An ambiguity, the set of the unambiguous sets were those sets that have the property that when you have A with B preferred to B and E that doesn't intersect both, you take the union of E and A and the union of B and E, the ranking is preserved. It's as before. So I, we identified all unambiguous sets in that fashion, and then we require that unambiguous sets themselves don't break each other. Well, that axiom gets you, in fact, it's going to get you that this is an algorithm. Okay, so that, that plays a role in the future that this is an algorithm. Okay, that's it. These are the main assumptions. Well, how come there are three more than you would have said? Well, uh, the reason is we still need the technical assumptions. Right? We still need the technical assumptions. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, no, there's one more real assumption. One of the additivity assumptions. Right? So, so there are two technical assumptions. So now I want to say the additivity is the same. Remember, Savage's world, additivity was supposed to hold always. And here we want a notion of additivity holding only when uh, it doesn't uh, affect ambiguity. Okay? So what do I mean? <coughs> here's, the, here's literally the Ellsberg paradox. Look at the events A and B. And in the Ellsberg paradox, most people apparently come to be an ambiguity of words. In a situation like that, people prefer betting on A to betting on B. A is lined up, B is not. Now you take unions of C, and notice that A union C is now not lined up. But C filled them just the nooks and crannies of uh, B, so now the B union C is nicely lined up. So you ask people which do you want to bet on, A union C or B union C, and quite predictably, as Ellsberg predicted, they prefer B union C. Okay. What went wrong? Well, look, A wasn't harming anything. Right? A wasn't breaking up any unambiguous event. B was breaking up some unambiguous event. And A was breaking up two and three. I added the C and the rows are reversed. Now, A uh, union C is breaking up a lot of events. But B union C isn't breaking up. These are situations in which I cannot stick to attitude. So the question is, that, and then what's left? What are the situations in which I want to keep it? Okay. Consider this. There's an A and B. Right? And now I'm adding C. Okay, now look, A was ruining B one, B was ruining one and two. C came and ruined three. But it ruined three for both of them. Okay, so in that case, I'm going to say it's okay. Uh, I want I want to keep at it. Okay, how do I say that? Well, it's a bit of work, but here it is. Uh, so remember, the first set is the set of all things that A didn't mess up, and the second set is the set of all things that A and C didn't mess up. Okay, I'm looking at things that were that are in one but not the other. And the way of saying that, the only difficulty in the saying that is when I add C, notice that two union three, uh, one didn't break up two union three. Fair enough? But when you add C, now two union three is broken. But I want to say that's double counting. The reason why two union three is broken up is three is broken. I don't want to include in the between the So this little bit of complexity in the definition says E is no E is not destroyed, and E is such a E, e is a set such that it's not it wasn't this, it's not destroyed by A. Moreover, uh, it doesn't have a significant intersection with any set that was not destroyed by A. So that's the part that moves out. <laughs> I want to say two, don't worry about two fields. Normally you would define this by saying all the sets in here, but not in there. I can't quite do that. All right? So this is the class of sets that have the feature that A did not break them up, but A union C does. A didn't destroy them, but A union C does. 
Here are the sets that find symmetrically. These are the sets that A union C uh, does in this world that A did. So remember, when you add C, all of a sudden you could fill out columns and new unambiguous events could appear. Okay? Um, and so that's the uh, second set. Okay? And I want to say AC, BC conform if they're disjoint and C, when adding C to A, creates exactly the same sets as adding C to B and destroys exactly the same set and sets as adding C to A. Okay? So, what does that mean? Here, this does it. Right? It creates, it destroys column 3. Uh, for both. This doesn't do it because it went exactly the wrong way. For A, it, adding C to A destroyed 2 and 3, which wasn't doing before. Moreover, it added 2 and 3 to B, uh, which wasn't there before. So this is really the worst case scenario. And now, obviously, it's the one that Ellsworth picked on first. Um, okay. Now I want to say additivity holds if and only if A, C, B, C conform. Savick said additivity holds, go away. Right now, we're saying only when things are conformed. To allow a room for uh, an uh, ambiguity aversion to survive. Okay, now the technical assumptions. Uh, this is the counterpart of being able to slice things finally. If A is strictly preferred to B, then you can slice the outside of B into sufficiently small slices so that each slice is similar to B. The similar is added. And then this is the, um, the, um, the continuity assumption. Uh, countable additive usually means the probabilities can't jump up. We can't insist on that. Remember, when you complete a column, probabilities are jumping up. So we can't literally insist on that. So what we require is they're not going to jump up as long as jump down as long as you're comparing each end to an unambiguous event, or you are slicing off um, unambiguous pieces. So again, Savage's Commission said if you have a nested collection of eggs such that uh, when you intersect them all, such that each one is preferred to be, then their intersection must be. We're saying this is true only in two cases. One, where the B is unambiguous, and two, where the nested sets differ from each other by an unambiguous. And these play, you no, know, of course there's more stuff, more work, so they do a little bit do more work for us, but these play the same roles in our thing as in Okay, what do they give us? Well, they give us a representation. What does it mean to have a representation? Well, we're going to call pi non-atomic if both the mu part and the eta part are non-atomic. And we're going to say a capacity pi represents a binary relationship if these two part representations are. It has to assign a greater uh, weight to a set, to A than B, and it has to assign a smaller set to A complement. Then the theorem says there exists a non-atomic uncertainty measure that represents the spinal relationship if and only if it's asked. Okay. So that's it. That's the main theorem. Okay, that's the main theorem. Uh, and then I want to give you a peek into how that you could extend this to um, to a, a preference over acts. Okay. Uh, you know, when Savage did this, of course he didn't really do it like that. He started with a preference over ads, let me tell you what those are, and then deduced the betting preference and got the probabilities, etc. Okay? Because our thing is incomplete, we couldn't do that. Uh, because a preference, you know, as a person to choose, and he's hoping he's going to choose. It's very difficult to observe the completeness. Okay? So we did a back, we're going to do a backward thing. We're going to assume, suppose, you have one of our guys, how can you extend it to a preference over X? Uh, what kinds of extensions that could be? Okay, so what do I mean by that? Think of monetary prices between W and zero. So you can lose a thousand dollars and you can gain a million dollars and anything you can do. 
bunch of, an ad takes an event space, this omega, and tells you in each outcome whether how much money you're going to get. Okay? We're going to look at simple ads, so you're going to get only one kind of thing. So if I draw a red ball, you're going to get $100. If I draw a blue three, you're going to get $35. So those are all ads. An ad preference is going to be complete transitive and continuous binary relation. And I want to say this act preference, act preference is the one with the star, is an extension of my well, that second one shouldn't have a star, sorry. Uh, is an extension of my qualitative and <coughs> relationship. If whenever you prefer B to I, then you must really prefer betting on B to I. And whenever you strictly prefer to be A, you must really like the act better than I. So, so whenever B is better than A, uh, according to this uh, binary relation, it must mean that you would rather get the best prize on B and the worst prize on B complement than getting the best prize on A and the worst prize And split for split. This, I think, is, you know, you may object to the exercise of starting with this binary relationship and extending the center, but given that, there's no other way to do this. Okay. Um, so, let me just introduce a piece of notation that's kind of common now. So, F A G, F is an act, G is an act, A is an event. I want to claim F A G is also an act. What kind of an act is it? It's the act that the act behaves just like A on F and just as G outside. Just like F on A and just like G outside. Okay. In each state in S, I look whether it's an A or not. If it's an S, then this act gives you whatever F would have given. And if it's outside of A, it gives you whatever it is. And constant acts, like $100, I'm going to interpret as the act that gives you $100 no matter what happens. Okay? <coughs> so here's the definition uh, that Machina Schmeiger used to get subjective probabilities without Savage's assumption that require uh, expected utility. He said, look, they said, we don't need to assume that you're an expected utility maximizer. After all, all probability means is the following. And what is the following? It says, suppose you like getting y strictly better than x and y hat strictly better than x hat. Then you must like this better than this. Then if you like the first row better, you know, if you have the preference in the first row, you must have the preference in the second row. That's too complicated to explain to them. And by the way, that's their assumption. So all I want you to know is that there are these two rows here. Okay? So here's what the rows mean. This is one act, right? This act gives you ten dollars if one uh, first row and first column occurs and etc. etc. These monetary prices. Here's another act. What happened, compare the two, notice that the red and the blue got swapped. And everything else stayed the same. Suppose you like the top box better than the bottom box. What does that mean? It means intuitively that you think red is more likely than blue. Right? Then, Machine Schmeider say, you must also like this better than that. How did things change? Well, the common things are still common. Act across acts, but what they give you change. You used to be getting a bunch of sevens, now you're getting eights and nines. But the two acts are the same. Um, the, uh, the good prize and bad prize change, but, um, but what? But still, if you like, if red is better, more likely than blue, you should still prefer that. So that's their acts here. Are we going to impose that? No, because if we impose that, we would get what they got, which is a probability. Right? So what are we going to do? We're going to impose exactly the same axiom. These two rows, I promise to you, much of our unintended typos are exactly the same as the previous ones. The only thing is now it's restricted to three cases. Okay, what are the three cases? Well, if A and B are similar, I want to. But of course, I want you to. I want it to be complete. I want everything to be right when things are similar, right? So that's understandable. When B is the empty set, it should work. But what does that get us? It means that if I take an event, you know, if you were supposed to get $100 a day occurs, and now you're getting, I offer you $150 a day occurs, 
you must like that. More money is better. More of a better thing is better. Okay. And the third one is, is this. It says, suppose the start numbers, 8, 9, 8, 9, etc., for both of them, here they were all 5, and here they were all 4. Then it must work. What does that get us? That means your ranking of these two things, even if there's ambiguity, your ambiguity attitude is independent of states. So if we were betting $100, you say, well, I'm not going to do it. But if we bet $50, I'm not so angry. We're not allowed. Okay? You may want to allow for that. I can show you what it will work with by us. But we're not allowing that. So that, uh, it's, so I don't know the answer to that. There isn't a whole lot of evidence on that, on the sort of sensitivity to amplitude and amplitude states and binary bets. But we're moving that. Okay, second, uh, and the lastly, I guess, want to go continuity. Lastly, we're going to require that the only reason you differ from expected utility theory is because of that. So as long as we have, we're looking at unambiguous events, your preferences are separate. Savage had this exact same <coughs> maximum, only he did it for all events. We're only required for unambiguous. What does this say? It says, well, if I give you two apps that have the feature, feature of outside of E, they're the same, both as state by state. And in one case, you like the getting F on E to getting G on E. Then changing the common things to something else common doesn't uh, affect you. So this is where the independence axiom comes from. This is where the additive separability of expected utility comes from, etc. We're imposing that, but only for an animal. And then we have continuity. Uh, it's, you know, we proposed it as an Archimedean axiom, but it's really continuity. What does it say? It says, the first line says, uh, I can find, there is no jump in quote unquote probabilities. So what, what I mean by that is, uh, if I give you three prizes, $100, $0, $50, and I tell you that I'm going to give you $50 if one event occurs and $0 if it doesn't, now I should be able to find a smaller event, presumably, than that event F, such that you would be willing to be different between this bet, getting $50 if F occurs and 0 otherwise, you'd be different between that and getting $100 if this event occurs. So how could this have failed? Well, if I took, you know, there, if there was no event that has exactly probability 0.5, this one. The same is a, the second one is a similar requirement for utilities. So, you know, if there was, you know, in a, if there was this, the next part would have failed if there was a, there was no prize that gave you utility 0.9. Utility, some prize that gives you 0.1, utility prize that gives you 0, but nothing. So this is continuity, right? It's continuity in events, and it's continuity in events. Okay. Um, okay. So those are the assumptions. So what we can just go over them. There is the uh, there is the weak separability, the weakening of the uh, machine Schmeiter condition, uh, weak sophistication, separability, and the argument. Okay, now we're coming to the uh, second and last result. Um, uh, so, let M be the set of all probability measures on sigma, and now to find, take an uncertain measure, that's one of my objects, pi's, and define the core of that as all probability measures that give you a value at least as much as pi to each event. Okay? In general, this could be not empty, but because we proved that uh, pi is convex, it's not, it's not empty. In general, it could be empty, it's not empty. Okay? Here's the representation we want. So the mysteries are we going to get it back to uh, So the, here's how the utility is going to work. I am going to uh, take any act. There's going to be a real number alpha. That's a parameter of your preference. 
and you're going to look at the sort of the core of my pi, right? The, the, the and to each event, you're going to assign the smallest uh, expected utility unit by choosing any probability division of the core. Multiply that by alpha. And then multiply uh, by 1 minus alpha, you're going to find the probability measure that gives you uh, the, 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 the highest possible thing in there. So I realize I didn't do that well. Let me go back to my little magenta example. So here, for example, this, the, uh, suppose I'm getting $100 if magenta occurs and zero. So the highest probability, uh, the lowest probability I can assign to this is exactly the pi of that. The highest probability I can uh, assign to it is 1 minus the pi of its common. So I'm saying compute the expected utility with respect to the lowest, the worst probability, multiply it by alpha, complete expected utility with respect to the best, multiply that by 1 minus alpha, add it. So that's a kind of a utility function, again, not at all novel to this work. Um, okay? It's called alpha max min. Okay? What we've done is uh, the capacities in the typically in this theory are general. We our theory is going to require some number. And, and here's the theorem. It says, an extension of one of our objects satisfies the three assumptions, weak simplification, separability, and if and only if it has an alpha maximum. <coughs> so, what is this saying? It's saying if you buy the two pieces, you know, continuity, you know, I'm hoping you do that. If you buy the sort of weakened notion of sophistication, that's the swapping the events, and if you're content with a theory that looks like, um, uh, Expected utility when you're betting over on ambiguous and satisfies the same kind of acceptability that any one of our extensions is an alpha maximum. Notice that if you're if, if the act was unambiguous, so each event, each prize was defined, each different prize was being given to you on an unambiguous event, there would be a single element in the And so alpha one minus alpha average would be exactly the expected. Right? So the, the trick, if you want to call it that, of this representation is the alpha is compromised so right? The only way to pull all this story together is to have an alpha. I'm a couple of minutes over. There is a very, uh, uh, there are a small sample of a very large literature. I mean, it's Thank you very much. Uh, everybody join us in the castle for dinner and drinks and uh, lots of fun. Yeah? I have a question. So, privately, you are trying to explain probability, right? A version of probability that incorporates ambiguity. Okay. So, as far as I know, I'm an economician. So, is there a relevant theorem in your work regarding the Bayesian Bayesian theorem for probability? Like, oh. are you conditional on something like when, so we have a probability, we have a conditional probability. Yes, so and not in this work, but this literature all on related stuff, so we're different, that's a big issue in this discussion. Yeah, yeah. So in this, it doesn't end well, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the results aren't satisfying. So uh, part of the difficulty of doing empirical work with ambiguity, there are two things. One is updating is very difficult, and, uh, and two is empiricism is very difficult. How are you going to uh, interpret an outcome as an ambiguous thing? Because frequencies tend to be additive. So, it is a big issue. We do not touch upon this in this thing, but we know a lot from the literature, and it's a big problem. So, updating doesn't work. Either. So, uh, there are two big uh, uh, versions of updating. One of them is 
taking these this, this sets and updating each of the measures in these cores one by one. That doesn't do so well. And then there's the um, Dempster's, uh, Dempster Schaefer, Dempster's being notion of updating. But that does a little better in some ways, but. Uh, and for the example you show, you illustrate a three by three. Mm -hmm. Can you go down to two by two? Yeah, so updating on unambiguous events is no problem. It's just as easy. The question is how to update on an ambiguous event. And that's a good problem. And that's a real issue. What's the problem? If you depend on which theorems you were uh, attached to, then many of them don't carry.